We are rolling, the piece is rolling for now. So anyway, everybody, welcome to the channel. Welcome back to the channel, which is still about furniture from the past and shedding some light generally on the mysterious subject while really just sharing with you the most compelling examples of it that I find. Now I have lost my voice, which is the universe telling me to shut up, but I can't do that yet because we have to discuss this marvelous exhibition quality piece of furniture in the neo-Gothic style. Now this is just the bottom half of it, which we are about to open, but that should give you an idea why we might refer to this as an exhibition quality piece, simply because something of this grandeur would have most likely been made for say, an exhibition like the World's Fair to showcase the virtuosity of the maker. Neo-Gothic just means that at the time this was a new interpretation of the much earlier 15th century Gothic style. Of course, this is something that we tend to associate with the church. The Gothic style is something we see in cathedrals, which should evoke the hunchback of Notre Dame, perhaps French architects of the 1860s like Eugène Viollet-le-Duc, who restored Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, and who was responsible for the spire, which tragically fell in a fire a couple of years ago. So that's the historical context. Might give you a few reference points to sort of identify with this style. Anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and unveil this majestic example of this type of furniture, and I hope that you'll all enjoy taking a closer look. Okay, well, it's out, and anyway, it's honestly a little dark. It's a bit outrageous, even within this already very wild and eccentric category of neo-Gothic furniture. And neo-Gothic, because here in the late 19th century when this was made, this was a new expression, a new interpretation of the original earlier 15th century high Gothic style, which of course you're going to recognize in cathedrals all across Europe. Now people often ask me what this is, which is a question that's kind of asked from a contemporary perspective of furniture's utility. That chopper will not leave us alone. We've literally got a chopper circling the building right now. The law is finally catching up with me. But anyway, the question of what this is is coming from a contemporary perspective of furniture's utility. And as you may have already noticed, much of the furniture, these pre-industrial period pieces that I feature, well, much of their utility is really just to be art. In any case, the works of furniture that we're going to be discussing here have artistic qualities that far surpass the scrupulous functional utility for which furniture is generally appreciated today. Much of it. With this understood as a work of decorative art, when we're looking at decorative art, we're generally going to be focused on furniture that was produced during that timeline when, for various reasons, furniture was most artistically and skillfully made. And that timeline stretches from the 1500s, the Renaissance, to the year 1840, simply because that's the moment in European history, well, when industrialization comes in and changes the art of furniture into something that's more of a commercial product made in factories. It's no longer tethered to these centuries of art furniture production. Now, neo-Gothic work, though, here in the 19th century, such as this piece, which was made after 1840, this is one of the exceptions to that 1840 rule, or pre-1840 rule. Now, this piece might even be made closer to 1900, but we see here with a work of neo-Gothic furniture that the 19th century still produced exceptional things. Now, collectors and historic furniture enthusiasts know this, and they have the eye to be able to choose from the vast body of 19th century works out there the most artistic pieces. But much of the general public who's interested in antiques, they don't yet understand that a lot of these later 19th century pieces out there are really fundamentally devoid of the originality and the skillful production that make earlier works of decorative art, earlier pieces of historic furniture, so compelling to us today as works of art or as objects with which we will decorate our homes. And anyway, in the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century, outside of the traditional timeline of what's good to collect, we're going to see that neo-Gothic works were often faithfully and expertly copied and in some cases, enhancements of the original 15th century style. And we're going to see some furniture like this, which was ordered by Mary of Orleans, and which we see here in a wonderful painting by Prosper Lafay, which is currently in the Musée des Beaux-Arts d'Orléans. 
And these pieces of furniture are clearly works of art, which were part of a magically designed, skillfully executed interior, which spared no expense. And in fact, I have several pieces of neo-Gothic furniture from this time, the 1840s, the 1850s, which will be part of a later video, and which are considerably less dark, perhaps a little more elegant than this late 19th century, maybe even circa 1900 monument, which is nevertheless perhaps a little bit more eccentric, captivating. So to answer the question of what this is, let's not knock that off, <laughs> this is a late 19th century exaggeration of a 15th century Gothic period dressoir from dresser la table or to set the table. So this is a piece that we often see depicted in 15th century great halls, that versatile room where they would dance, where they would eat. There was a fireplace and a long table, people playing medieval instruments. But anyway, we see that in a way, it's a piece that's associated with the table, with food, with feasting. And in fact, these cabinets here lock because at the time, you know, you would keep the prepared food behind a lock and key to keep some sort of medieval criminal from poisoning you. And of course, all of your servants would have to taste the food. And if they didn't die, then you could go ahead and eat. But what makes these neo-Gothic works from the 19th century, the most spectacular ones, quite compelling, is that not only were the 19th century, late 19th century makers exceptionally executing very faithful copies by hand out of oak here, this is patinaed oak, not only were they faithfully executing copies of earlier work, but see, they revived the 15th century style and then they added to it. They took that original aesthetic, even though they didn't come up with a new style, and they pushed it to new fantastical heights. They made the original style quite a bit more spectacular. So even if we would never see a Gothic dressoir from the 15th century that's quite like this, an original one really wouldn't be such an exuberant and mind-boggling expression of this style. So here we are, not with something new, but rather with a new and, let's say, pretty compelling expression of an original style. And that's where we have to be careful not to overlook these 19th century revivals as something that was devoid of artistry. So all over this piece, we're going to see the decorative repertoire of Gothic art and architecture, such as these spires here, the crockets that decorate the top of this wonderful canopy that just sort of looms over you. And then we have some open-worked Gothic tracery there between the crockets atop the pointed arches, onto which there appear to be some dragons clinging. And it's open-worked because we can see through it. The light can pass through. And then we're going to see that the tips of that open-work tracery appear to be forming fleur-de-lis. The same fleur-de-lis, that sort of royal French emblem that we're going to see right here. And I'm sure that that doesn't mean this piece belonged to anyone in the French royal household, but it's certainly evocative of the days of lords and lady and the French royalty of the 15th century. But anyway, as we look at this wonderful canopy, the second tier that just looms over you, we're going to see that there's this medieval orchestra that's perpetually playing some sort of tune for us here, and that there's even a fantastical swan that's joining in with the music here, playing, is that a lute? Uh, no, I think this is a lute. Excuse me for a lack of awareness of medieval musical instruments. But nevertheless, this swan is exceptionally here, joining in on the orchestra, and there is also a dragon up above, which appears to be playing a type of horn. But anyway, if we look beneath this canopy, we're going to see that we're really bringing the architecture of a cathedral into your home here with this outrageous piece of furniture. We have some quatripartite vaulting here, and we see that it's even been electrified, probably at a later date, perhaps originally, so that light would shine down onto these peculiar scenes of justice, these figurative sculptures here with people in medieval garb, this pointed hat. And then if we continue, we're going to see more elements of Gothic architecture here with these pilasters, these thin pillars, three of them together, which we're going to see in cathedral interiors all the time. Of course, they will be about a thousand times taller than this. And they're topped with bunches of Gothic foliage and then here we're going to see more open-worked tracery. Then we're going to see non-open-worked Gothic tracery all over the negative space behind the rest of this work here. More pointed arches with more tracery. More dragons, sort of mythological aquatic griffins with their beaks held together. 
there's quite a lot of concerning decor here. But then we see a scrolling foliage of thistle that comes here back to those fleur-de-lis. And if we come to the sides of the piece, we're going to see the Gothic linen fold motif, which is one of the key elements of the Gothic decorative repertoire as it represents the folded altar cloth in a church. We're going to see that repeated here, a nice frieze of linen cloth motifs along the bottom of the piece, which are albeit very dusty. And then if we come to the front of the piece, we're going to notice more of this wonderful tracery as well, a repetition of these pointed arches that we're going to see along the top of the piece, a real harmony to the decor, as profuse as it is. And then perhaps one of the things that interests me the most is this scene of justice, which appears to be the forces of order apprehending a thief perpetually in your dining room. And then most exceptionally, the weirdest part about this piece is the metalwork, which is a simulation of open worked wrought iron metalwork that we would have encountered on original 15th century pieces. Upon closer inspection, we can see that this is clearly late 19th century metallurgy that's been patinaed in an imitation of 500 year old metal. But if we look at these exceptional locks, we're going to see that the keyhole is blocked by an articulating Virgin Mary. And so you press a button beneath her and then she reveals the keyhole, which of course grants you access to the inner space, the rather constricted inner space of this otherwise monumental piece. And then we also notice finally that it does, if we want to go ahead and talk about the functionality of this piece, which clearly has an artistic value that surpasses whatever it could have been used for, but nevertheless, we do have some clues as to what it was used for when we open these three bottom drawers and we see not only a bizarre statue of the Virgin Mary, which I believe the previous owners kept there, I've decided to alter that and to leave it in the drawer, we're going to see here that we simply have organizational spaces for cutlery, as this was probably in someone's dining room not too long ago. And so, last but not least, to answer the question, there you have it, we have a 19th century exaggeration of a 15th century dressoir, from this French term of dresser la table to, to set the table, as this is technically a dining room piece, although we see here that the real point of this piece, what this really is, is that it's a way to bring the fantasy, the artistry, the beauty, sort of the wonder and the mystery of the Gothic style into your home. So with all that being said, I do hope as usual that you've enjoyed taking a closer look at this eccentric and, as I said, a little dark piece of furniture. And if you've enjoyed the videos, please like them and please subscribe to the channel as it would greatly help in the endeavor of creating an online period furniture library of all the most compelling pieces that I encounter. Thank you. I keep having to cut the video because we literally have a helicopter that's like circling. They're circling the Scientology building, finally. Anyway.